Heart arrhythmias, or irregular heartbeats, can have different causes, some of which are clinically inconsequential. But other causes can be serious and even life-threatening. That's why it's so important not to ignore the symptoms caused by an irregular heartbeat. On this week's Health Talk, we'll discuss the causes and the treatment of cardiac arrhythmias with a cardiologist and electrophysiology expert. Stay tuned for an important show. Health Talk is up next. Hello, I'm Dr. Eric Mazur. Today's Health Talk topic is cardiac arrhythmias. Dr. Teresa Menendez, a cardiologist with New Vance Health, is our guest and she'll discuss the causes, symptoms, and treatments for this common cardiac condition. It really should be conditions, because there are all sorts of different arrhythmias. There are. Well, again, welcome to Health Talk, Teresa. Thank Pleasure you. to have you. Welcome to Norwalk. I know you're new here at New Vance. Yes. And we're so lucky to have you. Well, thank you. I'm lucky to be here. So tell us a little bit, you're an electrophysiologist, you're a cardiologist yes. first and foremost, yes. but now you've sub sub specialized in electrophysiology. A lot of people at home may not know what that means. What, no. what, 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 what do you do? Yeah, no, that's it, true. It's a relatively new field. Uh, when I completed my cardiology fellowship, electro, cardiac electrophysiology was very new. It actually started in the 70s, both in Chicago and Penn and at Duke. And then it, uh, where I did my training at Baylor College of Medicine, I was working with the first electrophysiologist in Texas. I got very interested intellectually in uh, the study of the electrical system of the heart. And ever since then, it's become a subspecialty of cardiology. I did have to do an extra two years of training at that time. Um, and it is a, what I like to call my, tell my patients is I'm kind of like the electrician of the heart. <laughs> we diagnose arrhythmias uh, not only do we diagnose them with something called an electrophysiology study, which is like a catheterization, but we put catheters in the heart through the venous system, which is how you access. Yeah, I want to go through that a little while. Oh, so okay, maybe, sure. Uh, so go ahead. So you, 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 you so take it from there. Yeah, I do so, want to go through that. um, so that's how I got into it. And electrophysiology has evolved into becoming not only, uh, a very common thing that most hospitals have now, the ability to do interventions and how to treat arrhythmias with procedures, either with medications or ablations. Which is really evolving tremendously. I do think maybe we could start off for people at home, just giving a little bit of a layman's explanation of the electrical system of the heart mm -hmm. and how that has to do with our heart beating. Yes, well, uh, the electrical system is what tells our heart to beat. Without that signal, the heart does not contract. The electrical system starts in the top chamber in what we call the atrium in an area called the sinus node. Then it goes down into the middle of the heart in an area called the AV node. And then that sends a signal to the bottom chamber of the heart to tell the bottom chamber to beat. Without that signal, electrically speaking, the heart cannot beat. I think one of the really interesting things, if I may, uh, is the, it may, this really is like wiring. It's not, it is. It's, it's not sent by Wi-Fi. There are literally cells that go from the SA node through the atrium, conduct the electricity down to the AV node, and then we, I guess they call them uh, bundles of, or fascicles or whatever. But these are literally wires then that connect the, uh, the beating part, or sorry, the, the signaling part to the muscles, which then contract when the electricity hits. They are specialized. You can expand on that better than I can. No, no, they are specialized muscle cells that are able to conduct electricity really fast. Like if you're going down the tollway versus a dirt road and it rapidly activates the heart. So mechanically the heart can squeeze and pump blood in and out through your heart. And just like you can have it be normal, unfortunately sometimes the wiring of the heart can get uh, damaged due to different diseases that can affect the heart and then you have electrical wiring that is damaged and you can have short circuits, which can then cause arrhythmias. So you can really have a normal myocardium, if you will, the heart muscle cells can be normal, but if they're not electrically stimulated in the right sequence at the right time, you get much less effective cardiac output. It doesn't work as well. So yeah, so Absolutely. this is a, sort of an amazing idea. And you can go in, and well maybe you tell us more, you can actually go in and map the signal going through these wires, if you will. Absolutely, we can get what are called electrograms. We can get signals from the electrical wiring of the heart and let us know where the problem is. 
Sometimes what we could do is we could deliver, uh, do a procedure called an ablation, where we kind of quiet down um, the abnormal wiring um, so the arrhythmias go away. Sometimes we have to recommend a pacemaker or a defibrillator that takes over when the electrical system is not working well. So if, if I am a patient and I'm having a lot of irregular heartbeats, uh, what's the first step? The first step is to be aware that you're having a problem and not uh, blow it off, so to speak, because irregular heartbeats can be nothing or they can be the tip of the iceberg. I think when you reach a certain age, when you start having irregular heartbeats, you really need to be concerned that there's something else underlying the problem. There's a lot of occult cardiac disease that can present simply as palpitations, as extra heartbeats. And that would warrant, I think, going to see your doctor, letting your doctor be aware. Usually you start off with seeing a primary care physician who might order an EKG, might order a monitor that you wear for a certain period of time, and hopefully be able to capture those arrhythmias. Nowadays, there's lots of things that we can use at home with our Apple Watch or with our Fitbits or with other types of devices where we can monitor our rhythm at home. And I have seen many patients that have come in and they've been the first ones really to pick up these arrhythmias. It's really remarkable. We were talking about this before the show, but uh, you know, cardiograms that I was familiar with really are the 12 lead electrocardiograms which look at the heart electrically from all these different directions and it allows you to look and see whether somebody's having a heart attack, whether there's uh, excessive pressure in the heart perhaps, or whether it's grown too thick because of hypertension. The, what the monitors give you most of the information about arrhythmias, right, about rhythm of the heart. Well, remember that these monitors that are able, like the Cardia, for example, that are able to give you a paper copy or a digital copy, it is only one lead. Um, so we do have to be, uh, have a cautionary tale about that. There's, it's only one lead as opposed to what we're used to seeing, which is a 12 lead that really looks at the heart from many different angles. Um, but at least on a one lead system, there's a lot you can pick up as far as the etiology of the arrhythmias, where it's coming from, and things of that sort. So this isn't a gimmick. I mean, we've all seen this advertised on TV by getting the uh, uh, cardiogram grade EKG on your Apple Watch or on your uh, you said that's very, very useful when someone's having irregular heartbeats. Absolutely. I think that we all in our homes have lots of things that we may or may not need, may or may not use. There are certain things that I think people should have, like flashlight, batteries, extra water, fire extinguishers. Uh, I think medical equipment, like now with COVID, we're telling everyone, please get a pulse ox, check your oxygenation if you're short of breath. Um, blood pressure machines that are very easy to use now for anyone who's on antihypertensive medications. And I would tell patients if they can afford it, um, because you know, it, it, is, it does have a financial cost. Um, this, is, this is an invaluable tool to quickly diagnose your arrhythmia. In the past, I, we've used these Holter monitors, which are, I know I've worn them myself, where you're, you're leaded up and you, you carry around a box and you keep it with you for 40, 24, 48 hours, and I think there are event monitors mm -hmm. that you may only trigger when you have an abnormality, but you, again, you'll wear them for a month. Right. This is a way, if you have an uncommon sensation of your heart uh, jumping around in your chest, you can immediately. You can immediately so look at that. I was on a trip before the whole COVID thing hit um, on to Machu Picchu in Peru, and there was uh, somebody who was on uh, on the trip with us uh, who started to feel ill. And I had, I took it for that reason because I worried that, you know, when you're a doctor on a trip, you're the first one they call right. when somebody <laughs> has a problem. And uh, I was able to do a single lead EKG on him and I was able to reassure him that, that everything looked good on that. That's, that's great. That's really, really good. That's true. I, I remember I was on an airplane once and as a hematologist took care of a, a threatened abortion. <laughs> from a woman visiting from France. So we, we do get pulled into things that we're not really yes. really uh, comfortable with. But um, so, so as an electrophysiologist, you, you, you can map an arrhythmia more accurately than the EKG, which is sort of looking from a distance. Yes. Uh, maybe you could tell us a little bit about that and then what kinds of things you treat. And we should also mention atrial fibrillation. Since oh, that, that is mentioned so commonly, oh gosh, yes. you know, with the anticoagulants and stuff. Yes. That, so I think people 
have heard the term, I suspect most people don't know what it is, but tell us sort of what you do and then from a, both a diagnostic and a therapeutic standpoint. Sure, I think um, when somebody has an arrhythmia and it's caught um, on some sort of monitoring device, they usually get sent to me. Sometimes it's not caught, but, um, but the patient has a really good story. Um, they come to me, EKG is able to tell us something about the arrhythmia, but it's only once, I always tell my patients, it's like we're doing an EKG from the inside of your heart, not from the outside of your heart. And that's where you're actually putting leads up into we the heart. We put catheters in the vein through a small needle, uh, needle stick in the groin area, like when somebody has a heart cath to look at the arteries, and we call those the plumbers, and I'm the electrician, and we call the general cardiologist the, uh, the contractor. So the contractor <laughs> or the primary care physician says, look, you're my electrician, take care of this problem. So we put in catheters in the heart. There's ways that we can bring on arrhythmias because the majority of arrhythmias are on the basis of what we call reentry, which means we can bring on the arrhythmia by certain ways, the way we pace the heart. Sort of a heart. short circuit in the, in the wiring yes. of the heart, isn't it? And we also have what's called three-dimensional sort of virtual mapping that we can do, uh, which has been around now for well over 20 years. So we're able to laser point, pinpoint where we are in the heart and where the problem is. Uh, many times we can do an ablation and- And what does that word mean? Tissue. What's that? What does the word ablation mean? The ablation is where we target tissue that is gone awry, tissue that is no longer working well. In fact, it's causing a problem. There's two types of ablation. There's something called cryoablation, where we freeze the tissue and or there's radiofrequency ablation where we burn the tissue. But you're literally destroying that abnormal We're literally tissue. destroying the tissue. We're drawing water out of the cell either by heat or by freezing it, and that cell is no longer electrically active. Now, sometimes I tell my patients, I'm like a dermatologist taking off warts. We either freeze it or burn <laughs> it. Uh, but it's like we're doing it on the inside of the heart. And, and usually these procedures are done under, you know, light anesthesia like you'd have for a colonoscopy or an endoscopy and patients can usually go home the same day. Uh, that's amazing and then they often are free of the arrhythmia forever. Yes, 90 percent of the time. We have 30 seconds left, it's not enough time, but maybe you could just say two words about atrial fibrillation. Yes. What, what, is, what is that at least and maybe we'll have a chance another time to talk about it. Atrial fibrillation is a super common arrhythmia. As we age, uh, the majority of us may have episodes of AFib. It definitely increases with each decade. Over the age of 80, about 20% of people wow. will have AFib. It is an irregular rhythm from the top chamber of the heart where the heart, instead of beating with each heartbeat, kind of quivers like a bowl of jello. That sends a signal to the bottom chamber. The bottom chamber now starts to beat faster, a little bit irregular. It may or may not be symptomatic, but it dramatically increases our risk to have a stroke. In fact, 30% of the strokes in this country are due to atrial fibrillation. So it's very important to get attention to that to at least be covered for the risk of stroke. You know, we've run out of time. I think we should have you back just to talk about atrial fibrillation because right. Thank it, you. it's I'd such a to. common topic. Yes. And I think it's one that we really should address so people fully understand it because there are all sorts of interventions, both that you do and which yes. medical doctors do. Anyway, I, I think that would be a great, uh, thank you so much. That was really so instructive and so, so few people really understand that. Unfortunately, we have run out of time. I really want to thank my guest, Dr. Teresa Menendez, for joining us on Health Talk today. And thank you for watching. Remember to share any questions and comments you have by contacting us at healthtalk at newvance.org. We'd love to hear from you. Stay well, and again, if you're having some irregular heart beating, see your doc. Our fight against coronavirus isn't over. We still have to slow the spread and do our part. Let's wear face masks in public. Stay six feet or more from others. Follow state and local guidelines. Wash our hands frequently and stay home when we feel safe. For ourselves, for our loved ones, for our future. Let's move forward together. Learn more at coronavirus.gov. 145 over 92. 180 over 111. 182 over 100. And I had a heart attack and a cardiac arrest and then a stroke. Your blood pressure numbers could change your life. 
lot of people don't understand, including myself, I didn't, now I do, uh, the impact of having a shock. My memory is shot. When I woke up, I couldn't speak. If I would have followed a treatment plan, I would not be in this situation. It's a tough little journey. Lowering your high blood pressure could save you from a heart attack or stroke. If you've stopped your treatment plan, restart it or talk to your doctor about creating one that works better for you. Start taking the right steps at manageyourbp.org. It's a new life, but I'm going to make it better. I'm uh, coming back. Ask your doctor. Check your blood pressure. Heart arrhythmias, or irregular heartbeats, are a common cardiac symptom. However, there are different types and causes for this condition. The causes and type of an arrhythmia dictates its risk and its treatment. Our guest on this week's Health Talk, Dr. Teresa Menez Menendez, is a cardiologist and electrophysiologist. She'll discuss the benefits of electrophysiology studies in helping cardiologists diagnose and treat cardiac conditions. Dr. Eric Mazur. Today's health talk topic is diagnosing abnormal heart rhythms. Our guest is Dr. Teresa Menendez. She's a cardiologist and electrophysiologist with New Vance Health. She'll discuss the role of electrophysiology in determining the cause of abnormal heart rhythms as well as the treatment. Teresa, it's so great. It's great to have you on the show. It's great to have you part of Norwalk Hospital and New Vance Health. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. Uh, electrophysiology, uh, again, maybe briefly just tell people what that is and how that relates to the heart's anatomy. Sure. Um, cardiac electrophysiology is a uh, subspecialty of cardiology, it requires a separate board certification to really be an expert to evaluate the electrical system of the heart, to evaluate patients that have arrhythmias, to help decide the management, whether it's with medication, whether it's with a procedure called an ablation where we target abnormal tissue and uh, destroy that tissue so it cannot cause the arrhythmia or whether it's with uh, pacemakers or defibrillators, high-end, what we call cardiac implantable electronic devices. So you're sort of dealing in the a very romantic area for, for the lay people because you're dealing with the heart itself and you're actually measuring things from the inside of the heart. What does the patient feel if they're having an arrhythmia? If the patient is having an arrhythmia, number one, they may feel nothing, which is kind of surprising. Uh, they may come to their primary care physician for their yearly follow-up, they do an EKG, and they find that they, for example, are in atrial fibrillation. Arrhythmias from the top chamber usually are not as symptomatic, and that is not an uncommon thing to see. They may feel dizziness, lightheadedness, palpitations. They may pass out, and passing out is a very serious symptom of an arrhythmia. It usually means that the arrhythmia is coming from the bottom chamber of the heart, and that patient needs to be investigated to make sure they don't have any kind of underlying significant cardiac disease that is causing an arrhythmia like ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation, which can cause a cardiac arrest. Yeah, this is, uh, maybe people don't realize this, they may call it a heart attack, but you don't necessarily have to have a heart attack to have an abnormal rhythm that kills you. No, the majority of cardiac arrests in this country are not due to a heart attack. Only 20% are due to a heart attack. 80% are due to the fact that somebody has heart disease, they may or may not know it. Now they have abnormal tissue, the electrical wiring has now been damaged, and they have an arrhythmia causing a cardiac arrest. And that's why the AEDs are so important that we have now in most public places, the uh, automatic uh, electrical defibrillators. They are so important, and everyone learning CPR is so important. I know we, we talk about COVID a lot, but there are a thousand cardiac arrests a day in this country. A day, that's, that's a lot. And, and again, I think the, the point is so important. If you have an electrical mediated cardiac arrest, what's happening is the heart is not able to pump blood because the electrical system is getting scrambled. Basically your computer has, has frozen, if your you will. Your heart will not beat unless it gets an appropriate signal. If you get a signal that is inappropriate, either too slow for example, that's why the majority of people get pacemakers. Or if it's too fast, if it's going five to 600 beats a minute, the heart essentially is quivering 
and there's no way you can get and blood if you don't out. Blood, and there's no you way that, that you can survive that. But the remarkable thing is you can reboot this electrical system. Yes. And restore normal heartbeat. Yes. In the uh, outside of a hospital, the AEDs, uh, electricity works, as Ben Frank Franklin would say. And uh, shocking the rhythm back to normal is the very first thing you have to do. With internal defibrillators, uh, which is a type of de cardiac implantable device, it constantly monitors your heart rhythm. Should you go into one of these arrhythmias, should it be fast enough and last long enough, it will deliver a shock, again, to shock your rhythm back to normal. I have a question that I, that I don't know the answer to. Uh, back when I was in training years and years ago, uh, they often told us the first thing to do when someone is, you think someone is in a, an electrical cardiac arrest, is to just thump them hard on the chest. Uh, before you could, is that still considered, and I had one patient that I, by doing that, I remember getting from ventricular tachycardia back into a sinus rhythm. Uh, if you don't have an AED handy, is that something that you consider trying anymore? Or is that now considered? I don't passe? think it's in the ACLS protocol anymore. I, I don't think that that precordial thump has really been proven to be effective uh, to help stop an arrhythmia in its tracks. So, so we, you really need an AED, and those should be? AED and, and bystander CPR is yep. crucial. And uh, how does the AED work, if you will? What the AED does is you put the pads on and it analyzes the rhythm. It's, pro it's a very basic, it analyzes the rhythm, what the rate is, um, and it analyzes what the width is of something called the QRS, which is the signal that your body is putting out that's being picked up by the AED, like with an EKG. And then uh, it will charge up joules and it will shock the patient. So that shock is almost like a I guess a cranial shock to, it to, is, to stop a it seizure. Is, it's almost like when your computer gets frozen, how you have to reboot it. It reboots your heart. It just, so again, you can reboot somebody who is clinically dying. You can reboot their heart, and they can have basically a normal heart with an abnormal electrical system that then can be corrected, but they don't necessarily have to have end-stage heart damage? No. The majority of patients who do have a cardiac arrest do have underlying heart disease. There are patients who have cardiac arrest and have never had any heart issues. And when we evaluate them, they, they don't have anything wrong with their plumbing. They don't have anything wrong with their valves. They don't have anything wrong with their heart muscle. A lot of times that primary electrical disease is a genetic disease at the cellular level. And there are uh, patients who then the blood work would need to be sent out for certain diseases uh, like Brugada, CPVT, other diseases that are not in the in normal mainstream of what we see every day. So let's talk about, speaking about normal mainstream, maybe the, the two arrhythmias as an internist I was most familiar with, actually, is the atrial fibrillation, which we hear a lot about, and then you talked about ventricular tachycardia mm -hmm. or ventricular fibrillation. Maybe talk a little bit about both those, if you would. Sure. Um, atrial fibrillation is super common. As we age, uh, our risk of getting AFib increases. As we age, uh, most of us um, develop certain diseases such as hypertension, diabetes. Our hearts get a little stiffer as we get older. All those tend to increase what's called your left atrial pressure, which is where AFib lives. And if your atrium gets stretched, then that puts you at higher risk to have atrial fibrillation. So quivering of the, of the top chamber and the quivering does not allow an effective squeeze of that blood out of that chamber to the bottom chamber. So you, you drop your blood pressure, you get dizzy, you get lightheaded, you get palpitations. It also increases your risk to have a stroke. You explain that if you would. What happens when the atrium quivers, when blood sits anywhere for a long period of time, what's it gonna do? It's gonna clot. So there are certain areas in the atrium where blood tends to hide and even once it begins to squeeze better again, it tends to hide there for a while. One specific area is called the left atrial appendage. It's kind of like a windsock. It's, it's off of the left atrial appendage. It doesn't really do anything. It's kind of like the appendix. It's only there to cause problems. And that's where blood clots tend to hide the majority, 95% of the time. And then when your rhythm goes back to normal, it can, it can go and it's in the, what we call the arterial system. The arterial system is, an, is not where you want clots because it can go out, it can go up to your brain and cause a stroke. It can also cause 
issues in the rest of the body. When it's on the left, when it's on the right side of the heart, in the venous side, we don't worry that much about clots because the, the lung serves as a filter. Kind of like an air filter. A lot of people may not filter. realize the blood goes to the heart, to the uh, right side of the heart. It is pumped through the lungs, then goes to the left side of the heart, where it's pumped through the body. Lungs have a very effective filter in it. I, yeah. I always tell my patients, the lung is like your air conditioner filter, okay? Yeah. And, and any stuff that's on the right side is not as important. But once it's on the left side, the arterial side of the heart, that's where it can cause damage. Now, I remember as a medical student seeing a bubble in an IV go into a patient's vein and thinking, oh my God, this is terrible. And of course it was nothing because that bubble from the right that went into the lung it got dissipated there, never got into the body. That same bu bubble in the artery easily could have caused a stroke. Actually, one of the few times that I've ever been put under anesthesia, that's, I saw a bubble go into my vein and I got worried, <laughs> but I said, no, I, the lung will take care of it. Not a problem. So when you see somebody with uh, atrial fibrillation and this chaotic atrial message that doesn't give you a good, strong, organized beat to the ventricles, uh, what do you do? The very first thing you do is you educate the patient about what they have. You make sure, number one, the rate is controlled at rest and with exercise. You make sure that you put them on a blood thinner, assuming they are not at super high risk. And to be and the blood thinners really work. I know they reduce the, the risk of embolism of, of a clot, six, eight percent, you know, down to a percent or so. The original studies done with Coumadin were done eons ago. They were done in the late 1980s. Um, I don't think we'll Doesn't ever... Doesn't seem that long ago to me. <laughs> not long. But, uh, so I think we'll never have a study of placebo versus Coumadin again. I think that, that question was answered. And recently, the newer agents, the uh, newer oral anticoagulants um, appear to be just as good as Coumadin and probably safer. Yeah, the, the NOACs or the DOACs. Yes, uh, yes. I think we used to call them the NOACs the new oral anticoagulants, but they're not new anymore, so now we call them the, the DOACs. DOACs with direct acting because oral they're direct anticoagulants. Acting, so and the, the wonderful thing about them, as you said, is they probably have fewer side effects. Yes. They probably work a little bit better. They're some, easier to take. Um, but you don't require But they're as expensive as can be. Hopefully, that's gonna get better. Uh, hopefully, I know that uh, we're dealing with that in our family right now, but they, they're expensive agents, but they're great agents. They've really been a major advance in anticoagulation. So once you've had rate control and once you've been placed on Coumadin, I mean, excuse me, on an oral anticoagulant, then you have to do a cardiac workup. You have to figure out why does this person have AFib? Is this a loner? Is this a lone AFib person? Which probably really doesn't exist. Um, is this somebody who has a cardiomyopathy, somebody who has valvular heart disease, somebody who has underlying coronary disease? Again, this is the tip of the iceberg that you found. You need to look underneath and see what else is going on. And you address those issues, hypertension, valvular heart disease, coronary disease, congestive heart failure. And then you talk with the patient about making a decision to try to decide whether or not your symptoms are such that treatment for AFib is warranted. Just because you have it doesn't mean you need to be in a normal rhythm, be put back we in a normal rhythm. We have only 30 seconds left, but go ahead. And that's done either with medication or with ablation, so I apologize. And ablation is actually ablation what is you do, we, highly specialized. We target, specialized. yes, we, we target the abnormal tissue that usually comes from the left side, the left atrium, usually at the orifice of what are called the pulmonary veins. So you actually go into the heart and directly manipulate the electrical system tissue. We electrically isolate the pulmonary veins by drawing a circle around them. And then you, you destroy and the... And then the signals from the pulmonary vein cannot go out to the atrium and cause the AFib. Okay, and that's, you don't, hopefully don't make holes in the, the arteries as you're doing that, right? Hopefully <laughs> not. No, so this is a remarkable, this advantage of, uh, of being able to actually interrupt the electrical system and rewire... But not, not everyone is a candidate for ablation, and not everyone responds to ablation. And that's why we have experts like you to let us know. Thank you very much. And again, we could go on talking for hours about this. It's so interesting, thank but you. we have run out of time. I'd like to thank my guest today, Dr. Teresa Menendez, for joining me on Health Talk. And thank you for watching. Remember to share your questions and your comments by contacting us at Health Talk at newvancehealth.org. We'd love to hear from you. Stay six feet or more from others. Follow state and local guidelines. Wash our hands frequently and stay home when we feel safe. For ourselves, for our loved ones, for our future. Let's move forward together.
coronavirus.gov.